Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted you can join us today. I'm Stefan Shakespeare, the CEO of YouGov. And some quick background first. This webinar is part of an ongoing program of research and discussion on public opinion and the future of globalization. It's based on an annual tracking study called the YouGov Cambridge Globalism Project, which started last year and surveys 25 of the world's largest countries, produced by YouGov in collaboration with three important partners, namely the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, as well as the Guardian newspaper and researchers at Cambridge University. To discuss some of the key findings of this research, I'm joined by Tony Blair, Executive Chairman of the Tony Blair Institute and, of course, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and by Indra Nui, former Chairman and CEO of PepsiCo and now a Director on the Board of Amazon. Before we start, also a quick mention to our audience, please feel welcome to submit questions in the Q&A box, and we'll aim to answer some of these later on. So I'd like to start with considering some interesting data that we have on populism and polarization. Perhaps the most important and unexpected finding of our research, very counterintuitive, I think, is that attitudes to globalization tend to be fairly moderate and nuanced across the political spectrum rather than polarized, as is often uh, uh, emphasized. There is a significant divide in many countries on whether or not immigration should be restricted, but beyond that, we find that all the big groups, whether globalists or anti-globalists, whether those who want to reduce immigration and those who don't, all sides show a surprising degree of consensus on wider liberal attitudes. In the US, for example, the larger portion of both groups agrees that qualified migrants are good for their country, that democracy is generally the best type of political system, that men and women are equally suited to doing all or most jobs, that there, is climate that there is climate change and it's a problem and it's caused by human activity, that ethnic minorities face a significant amount of discrimination, and of course they're very comfortable across the board with same-sex marriage. Perhaps crucially, we also see a similar kind of overlap between Biden and Trump supporters in the US sample, which uh, with some surprisingly broad agreement on more progressive attitudes. So the first question I'd like to put uh, to you, Tony, uh, first of all, is this. Four years after the Brexit vote and then Trump becoming president, do we need to revise the narratives of liberal globalists versus illiberal nativists? Or to put it another way, do we still see Trump's abiding supporters, and there are still plenty of them, as the deplorables? Yeah, so I think your, your poll, Stefan, is really interesting, but also, for me at least, not, uh, not really surprising. I mean, I, I've always thought that the, the issue has been that the political parties themselves have become much more polarized and groups of activists have become much more determined in pulling their parties away from the center. But there's a broader range of agreement between people than, than is often thought. So it doesn't surprise me that people see a lot of advantages in global cooperation, um, in using technology for the best purposes, um, of improving the quality of life in, for example, making sure that you can attract uh, high quality people into your country and at the same time being worried if immigration seems to be going out of control or people feel there aren't proper rules around it. And I've always said to people about immigration, you know, if you don't have rules, you get prejudices. So that's why you need rules, but it doesn't, it's always been a false polarization to say people are either in favor of unrestricted immigration, or they basically believe you should kick all the immigrants out. It, it's, it's never been like that. And I think, you know, the Trump support, um, for example, in the US, I've always thought is much more nuanced than people think. It's, yes, it's made up of some people who go to the rallies and chant the stuff and all the rest of it, but that would never get him anywhere near that number of votes. So a proportion of those votes comes from people who, you know, for whatever reason, believe that the present system isn't working properly. And I will say about populists, they exploit grievances, but they don't create them. The grievances are real. And I think what um, democracy has as a challenge at the moment is essentially the challenge of efficacy it's in circumstances where people want change, they want certain issues dealt with. The populist 
seem to want to break through the wall and make the change, whereas a lot of conventional politicians, you know, sit around essentially contemplating the problem rather than dealing with it. And therefore, I think that, you know, this is where I think one of the really interesting things arising out of the US election, to my, to my mind, is that both main political parties there have a challenge and they're very similar to the challenge of the Conservative and Labour Party in the UK. And the challenge is, can they create a set of policies that provide change for people, which in fact bring in the centre ground rather than alienate them? And you know that's why I will say, for example, for the progressive side of politics, the challenge that the, the progressive side of politics has, Democrats in the US, Labour Party in Britain, but you can see this all over Europe, is that the radical people appear not to be sensible and the sensible people appear not to be radical. And the question, therefore, for actually both main parties and both main groups is how do you create an agenda for change that strikes people as sensible and meets them in that place that your poll has identified, where people say, well, look, I'm not anti-globalization and neither am I pro-globalization in that sense. I want a, a sensible, nuanced view of the way the world works. And that leads me to my concluding point, which is the ground for the center is as strong as ever. It's just the absence of representation that's been the problem. Thank you, Indra. How do you respond to that? Reading Angus Deaton's book, Deaths of Despair. And I think in many ways it laid out the entire story and answered the question that you're raising, Stefan. I look at the working class people in the United States, especially the white working class, their lives have not really improved over multiple years. Their water mortality rates are very, very high. Manufacturing jobs have gone in large portions of the Midwest. Technology has disrupted a lot of what they're doing and their jobs have moved overseas. And they feel they've been left behind. And when you have that sort of situation, without any hope for the reshoring of manufacturing for their jobs to come back, I think it does create a fairly negative mood. And even people who have embraced immigrants, you know, this country is built on immigration. People have embraced immigrants. I'm an immigrant myself. All of a sudden find themselves on the wrong side of the discussion because they don't see their lives improving. So I don't think this is about labels or whatever. I think it's a simple discussion on what do we do with those people who built the backbone of the country here? And how do we make sure we bring industries back that put them back to work? And if we can't do that, how do we pick up their children, their next generation, and make sure they've been educated in the technologies that are needed for the future? Because we have to think intergenerationally, uh, because that's the only way we're going to be able to lift the succeeding generations and make sure they're ready for the jobs of the future. I think that's the root cause of all the problems that we have today. The labels are just the manifestation of their frustration. If it's the case that, uh, that, that people are not so polarized, uh, but the, the representatives or the politicians, the political parties are, um, why does that happen? Why has politics not adapted to that center of ground? Um, what, what's been in the way of that? Well, I think it's, it's partly because, as Indra says, okay, you, you've got a group of people whose grievances are real. And the test in politics is always, do you exploit a grievance or deal with it? And dealing with it is hard, by the way. So if, if you look at the, the, the way the world has been changing over this past 20 years and the change with the technology revolution is gonna accelerate again over these next years, you know, it requires quite deep structural change around things like education and building a modern infrastructure, making sure people have the skills that is necessary to navigate the new world, um, how do you make sure that you get that integration of communities that are changing with, with um, migrant populations coming into them? You know, these are not easy questions. And therefore, the, the, the simple thing often when you've got a grievance like that is that you exploit it. And, and I think in political terms, what's happened is that there's been a big change also in the media, conventional and social. Social media is, you know, I mean, look, it's, my view is it's 
frankly, you know, it's a bit of a plague on modern politics, frankly, because it's it 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 lends itself more easily to the exchange of abuse than argument. And then you've got conventional media that I think, I think actually both sides of the Atlantic has become very, very polarized also. And it's become polarized partly because the, the commercial model of the conventional media, as the media is fragmented and the internet is growing, that conventional commercial model has really disintegrated. And therefore, I think for a lot of media outlets today, they think their route to commercial survival is to take a group of people and keep them in a permanent state of anger and grievance. You know, that is the, that's the way that they stand on their feet in financial terms. But the trouble is what that does is distort the political debate. So I think the big challenge, and this is what the poll illustrates, is if there are these real problems, but there's nonetheless a broad consensus as to how you try and approach the world, the challenge for, for, for the policymakers is how do they fashion an agenda that allows you to deal with these grievances in a sensible way, in a way that creates the change that people want to see, but change that actually works and that keeps our values intact. And that's, you know, that's the challenge. And I think it's a, uh, Obviously, it's the challenge that my institute tries to work on, but it's a very, you go around the Western world today, societies appear very, very divided. It's just that I think underneath that division, there's more points of unity than we think if we could find the right language and policy to unlock them. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Indra, I'm gonna to come to you first on this one. I know this is an area that interests you, uh, China, and global cooperation. Uh, another striking feature of our research is how China has experienced significant damage to its global reputation over the past year. Uh, it was rising uh, before the pandemic. Uh, compared to the results from 2019, we've seen a big drop in the number of people who think China plays a positive role in the world. In 15 out of 25 countries, this includes at least a drop of 10%, even 20% in six of those countries. Uh, now, uh, the Chinese narrative on global leadership also uh, is affected by this and is finding little support from the rest of the world. In all the countries we surveyed, many more people still choose America over China as the country that they would prefer to play the most powerful force in world politics by a substantial margin. So the question to you, Indra, is, is this. To what extent do you think leaders should follow public opinion in taking a harder line towards China? Or should it be the opposite? What have we learned during the pandemic about the realities of global integration and cooperation at a time that we also see increasing tensions between the great powers? You know, this one is a tough one because when I was running a company, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking in the period 2006 to 2018, when I was still CEO, if you didn't have a China growth strategy, you got killed in, in the uh, uh, stock market because you said the biggest growth market is opened up why don't you have a growth strategy for China? Why aren't you investing enough? We had to talk about our shares and our investments in China broken out. One year, the whole perception has changed. The fact of the matter is China is still a big market. There's still 1.3 billion consumers and you know, it's growing. So the first point I'd make to you is that uh, let's not write off China. China is still an important market. We talk about taking a harder line to China. Let's think through this. Viruses know no borders. You can't build a viral curtain between China and the rest of the world. That's not gonna happen. You can't have two digital standards, a China digital standard and the rest of the world digital standard. So when we talk about taking a hard line and isolating China, which is what many people talk about, I don't think that's realistic. And I think our best option is to figure out how to make China a partner and work with us in a constructive way because isolationism in these times where the whole world is unfortunately or fortunately completely interconnected is a formula for disaster. Now, at the same time, I don't think the West can tell another country, we don't want you to rise. I think we have to think about how to deal with two superpowers and how is the power balance gonna work? Look, there's been so much written about by economists on the Thucydides uh, theorem, whatever it is, 
Everybody knows what would happen when two superpowers come up. Why was all this written about, but we didn't think through all this before we included China, the WTO, and told all companies to go into China. So I'm going to come back and say, including China in global trade, including China in our global discussions and deliberations is a critical aspect that we all have to address if we want the world to be you know, sensible and not go through multiple lockdowns and multiple skirmishes everywhere in the world. I believe that China is a critical player in the world. Tony, what do you think should be the attitude of the West towards China? Well, I think it just made some really important points. And by the way, I should have said right at the outset, how delighted I am to be doing a, a, a panel discussion with her. And you know, her experience in being head of a major multinational company is something you know you should take account of. So I so I look at China in, in, in this way. We need a strategic framework for our relationship with China. And that will encompass areas where there will be a lot of pressure to confront China. You know, you could talk about Hong Kong, treatment of the Uyghurs, um, you know, issues to do with global trade, South China Sea, Taiwan. There's going to be areas where the relationship is going to be difficult. And then there are going to be areas, frankly, where we're competing. And technology is a very obvious area. But where I agree with Indra completely is you've got to reserve some space for cooperation because the fact of Chinese power, because China is no longer a rising power, it's risen, is natural and right. And by the way, in, in, in now increasingly, it will be joined by India. So that power of China for reasons of size, uh, population, civilization, economy, it's real. On the other hand, the op optimism of people like myself when we were in government, that as China became more prosperous economically, it would develop democratically in a, in a more Western direction, let's say. That's obviously not happened these last few years. There's been a, a more aggressive external stance and a more oppressive internal stance. But you've still got to deal with China. And you only have to look at global pandemic, that's one example, climate change, another example, actually anything to do with the global economy, and we need China. So my view very simply is this, what we need with China is not a set of ad hoc reactions, we need a strategic framework. And one of the things I think will be most important for the new administration in the US to do with European allies, and with our allies also in the, in the East of the world, um, Japan, Australia, others, is to fashion that strategic framework in which, yes, you recognize there will be some confrontation, you recognize the inevitability of competition, but you also recognize the necessity of cooperation. Thank you. I'm gonna move to our third topic, uh, which is about technology and government. Uh, before I do, don't forget, you can still ask questions using the Q&A box uh, on your screen, uh, and we'll get to those uh, quite shortly. So, uh, Tony, coming to you first on this one, because I know it's an important subject for you, uh, the uh, relationship of technology uh, and future government. Um, we have uh, uh, seen with Amazon uh, and, uh, uh, and the Zoom platform we're on today, uh, the important fundamental role uh, that companies like these have, have in enabling uh, society to continue functioning during the pandemic. Part of our collaboration with the Tony Blair Institute has involved in-depth research into public attitudes towards technology, regulation, and uh, the relationship between state and private sector. And a clear finding of this research is that so far, we have seen little in the way of a public backlash against technology, or techlash as some have called it, and have predicted in recent years. For example, there are high levels of support across the board for large technology companies to play a significant role in major areas of public policy and healthcare and education uh, and welfare and police and pensions, a whole lot of uh, areas of public policy where people support uh, the involvement of large technology companies in public policy. Now, uh, in some ways, um, you, you, you think, well, you know, this pandemic has, has hastened that, uh, will hasten that. Uh, do you think that's, uh, that's all to the good? Um, do you, what do you think will come of this? Um, what will be the effect on government 
um, uh, from the from the importance of these uh, big technology companies, Tony. So, Stefan, one of the things I always say to people about politics is you've got to recognise that that people have the right to be uh, some sometimes inconsistent or appear to be inconsistent in their views. So, I think when it comes to technology companies, for example, around paying their fair share of tax, concerns around privacy, people as citizens are quite worried. But when it comes to what these companies do provide by way of service, I think people are basically, well, those companies wouldn't be successful unless people wanted it. And, you know, part of the whole rationale for my institute is to say that the challenge of politics today is to make sense of the technology revolution because it's the biggest fact that is happening in the world. It's the 21st century equivalent of the 19th century industrial revolution. And, you know, I, I draw attention to the fact that back in the 19th century, as the industrial revolution got going, the political debate took a long time to catch up with it. So in, in British politics, people were still having old style Whig and Tory debates when you know, the world was actually revolutionizing um, around them, changing the countryside, changing industrial production, breaking the link between population and GDP, um, urbanizing at a vast rate. So whole new industries springing up. And I think we're in the same position today where you've got to get policymakers and change makers together because the truth is technology is going to change the way we live, the way we work, and it should do. So when you, you've, your poll findings say that people support a role of technology in, for example, public services, this is, this is part of the, the answer to the problems we were talking about in, in the first part of our discussion. The most important thing in healthcare is how we use technology to improve healthcare. The most important thing in education is how can we use technology to educate differently and better and in a much more personal way. Technology will transform, transform transport, but it should also transform law and order and it should transform the way government works. It's for sure going to transform companies. So my, my point about this is that we need to get this dialogue between change makers and policy makers going because it, this technology change is the way that we are going to, to be optimistic about the future, provided we can master the technology and harness it for the public good and spread its benefits equally. So I think just one final point on this, I think the pandemic has shown us both the value of technology, but I also think it's had an accelerating effect on its deployment. And you know, that's why I think once this pandemic issue settles down, if you then turn to say the question of climate change, there is no way out of climate change other than through the acceleration of the development of science and technology. Africa's population is gonna double in the next 30 to 40 years. They're going to build roads, power stations, airports, airlines, they're going to develop. Unless we can find the means of developing sustainably, we're gonna have a serious problem. So this is why the technology question is important. And I think the public gets it. My anxiety is that the policymakers as of yet don't. Uh, Indra, um, we're extremely uh, privileged to have you here for this conversation, um, precisely on this topic. Your company, Amazon, uh, has played a massive role in the infrastructure uh, that keeps people uh, living something like normal lives uh, in many places. What is the experience from you as a, for you as a, as a as part of that company? Uh, what, what has that taught you about the future, uh, the role of technology uh, in 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 infrastructure in in public infrastructure? First of all, it's an absolute privilege to be here with Tony because I'm listening to him and I'm learning a lot more than contributing to this panel. So Tony, thank you for inviting me. I have to tell you. For those that were skeptical about technology before the pandemic, exactly as Tony said, you could not have survived the pandemic without technology. Uh, seniors could not have survived the pandemic without Amazon delivery. Education couldn't have gone on. Medicine couldn't have gone on because telemedicine became a big factor during the pandemic with technology. Gaming, you entertained yourself with Netflix and gaming. So in many, many ways, 
technology is what enabled your life. Um, I think one of the big issues we've got is you've got technology progressing at a breakneck speed and disrupting and changing industries. And you've got people and knowledge in governments and in policy making bodies who are perhaps a couple of generations behind. It's difficult because we don't pay enough to people in government to be the best and brightest at technology because if you're really good, you go to work for private enterprise. So I think what you've got is people looking at regulation as a blunt instrument. So I think it's very, very important that we don't take these technology companies that are sort of the seat of innovation, that are seat of disruption in a world where everybody's focused on technology. When we talk about competition with China, are we gonna let Chinese companies in technology just emerge stronger and stronger? And we're gonna sit down and think about regulation in the West? I hope not. I think we should not use regulation as a blunt instrument. I mean, to me, the classic example is way back in the 70s, we broke up uh, the big AT&T system. It's reconstituted over time. And so I think we have to think through very, very carefully uh, uh, the, the, the technolo the, what technology is doing to improve society. Now, let me tell you the negative aspects of technology is all from social media. That's what people look at and say, see, they're disrupting society. And the reason they say that is because they believe every person lives in their own bubble. They're fed news just for them. Uh, you know, everything is targeted and they never come out of the bubble. And so all, uh, what people start to sign up for, the conspiracy theories. But I have a different perspective. If you didn't have news curated and fed to you, how are you going to navigate social media? It is just this enormous cache of information Unless somebody is going to curate it for you, you'll never know how to navigate it. So I think the real issue we've got to get to is how are we going to get people to see a curated set of information that's more balanced than extremely one side or the other? So let's not paint a bad uh, all of technology with a negative brush. I actually believe that if an Amazon didn't exist today, we'd be creating one to go against an Alibaba. If a Netflix didn't exist, we'd be creating one. So every one of these companies have their role to play in society. And we ought to celebrate them today because they got us through the pandemic. Thank you, Indra. We have very little time left. So I'm gonna ask you, instead of making a, a, a bigger contribution, just to make a prediction um, uh, to this next question. And then we'll go to questions from the audience. Mm. Um, people have talked about the pandemic as perhaps the greatest natural experiment in history as lockdowns have forced mass behavioral change in a way that's led to unrivaled reductions in carbon output. Uh, we've seen uh, on our, in our surveys uh, that while, uh, again, uh, Tony talked about the contradiction in, in people's response to some of these questions, uh, they, there's a striking majority, there's a huge global consensus um, across all 25 countries uh, that climate change is something that is very important and something has to be done about it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, majorities, again, in nearly every case, tell us they expect to increase or make no change in how they travel by car or airplane after the pandemic is over, over compared with life before. So despite a COVID boost to pro-environmental behaviors now, we may still face a significant gap between values and action. What do you think? What is the effect of the pandemic going to be on the, uh, uh, on the question of, of, uh, uh, of the environment? Uh, just a very short answer, please, from, from each of you. Um, Tony first. Yeah, I think you've got to look at what people want. People, I think, may, may want to work from home more. Uh, I think one of the big problems is going to be the inequality but there before COVID is going to be there afterwards even magnified. But I think for a lot of people who can work from home, they'll want to work from home more, but they'll also want to travel still when they want to. And that's why I come back to my point that the only solution to climate change is to get the science and technology incentivized and accelerated and deployed. And this is a big, big feature for global cooperation. Thanks, Indra. There's a whole education that has to be done in a very simple, easily understandable way. I think climate change has been in many ways, uh, been used as a stick to enact various policies. I think we've got to educate people how even the pandemic was exacerbated by climate change. And we have to explain that as we get ready for the next pandemic, addressing this issue of climate change is one of the ways we can lessen its impact on us. 
So I go back to education, significant education. Um, I'm uh, excited that we got this far. We, we're on time as I hand over to Benedict. Benedict, Benedict you're going to do the questions. Hi, uh, thanks, Stefan. And thanks everyone for the questions you sent in, uh, both in advance uh, on the chat as well as on Facebook Live. Uh, had a lot of very interesting topics. Um, I think probably a good place for us to start, given sort of actually slightly where we ended, is, is Tony, you talked a bit about this partnership between change makers and policy makers. Um, and one of the questions is that basically politicians have been quite slow to act or scared to act previously. And I think sort of COVID pandemic has, has highlighted this. And so the question is, how do politicians become change makers in a way that is authentic and meaningful? And um, what role does the private sector need to play in this? And I think, you know, I'd love to hear both Tony's perspective and the other uh, panelists perspective on this from both the, the politician side and the private sector side. Yeah, so for, from the politician side, a lot of it's to do with understanding. You know, if politicians had more knowledge of the potential of technology to change things in a positive way, they would respond better. So what I find with politicians is if you go and talk to them about technology, they'll go, yeah, Facebook and regulation. And I say, yeah, okay, there's that, but what about how it can transform the way that we, we live our lives in a beneficial way? And then you start to explain some of the things that technology is going to do. So I think the most important thing I would say is for the technology sector, rather than seeing politics to be something that's avoided at all costs is we need structured engagement between change makers and policy makers so that those people in public policy positions, as Indra says, who are you know, a couple of generations often behind technology change, they've got a better understanding of what can be done and a better understanding therefore of how to enable the acceleration of beneficial technology. And don't just focus on the external aspects and the consumer interface with the technology worry a lot about the engines that drive the technology because if you go off and sort of vilify these companies and start to break them up without really understanding what holds them together, you're gonna to end up severely impacting these companies because there's a technology platform that holds many of these companies together. So going back to what Tony said, it's critically important that regulators, people in politics truly understand not just what the company does to society, but how it operates. How does it build its capabilities? How does it create jobs? I mean, look, every one of these technology companies, even through the pandemic, are creating tens of thousands of jobs. So at some point, I think we have to say something nice about these technology companies as opposed to vilifying them all the time, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I wonder, Stefan, you could probably give a bit of a sense of some of the public views on this have been shifting in, you know, recent years, some of the backlash against big tech and sort of how do you see these sort of trends playing out, um, you know, with sort of the views and how politicians can potentially connect with the public in a way that sort of reframes some of this question? Well, we've certainly seen, we've certainly seen attitudes change um, over this pandemic uh, and be, as you say, um, uh, as Tony said, rather um, uh, contradictory, which is that they have um, uh, they've been you know been very negative about technology in some respects, but are now recognising the importance uh, as we've measured in our in our survey of that. Um, it's very hard uh, for them, particularly uh, in the election we've just seen. For example, the Facebooks we talked about social media. Uh, I'm not sure that we have an answer to how. Um, uh, for example, the, the, the fake news should be dealt with because um, the, these companies do not want to become seen as censors, uh, but at the same time, um, we're looking to them to control their platforms. Uh, and, the, and it's a very different form of media. We talked about, uh, Tony talked about the, uh, the role of mainstream media. I thought it was very interesting in, uh, in the, the business model, uh, favoring um, uh, 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 argument and, and polarization. Uh, it has been that way with social media as well. Uh, so, you know, we need to look at the uh, at the effects of that business model on the dialogue. Yeah, yeah great. Um, and so, Tony, you sort of presented this model of the sensible but radical sort of approach to politics today, uh, uh, in which uh, one of our sort of questions came in as a very attractive way of protecting citizens from the worst of globalization. Um, but as they say, it, this hasn't fared too well in the West recently. Um, and I guess, how does the radical center of politics animate itself and regain its mojo is the question. And again, I'd like to sort of see that perspective about 
how you you create those sort of collaborations and cooperation i think to see you know, from the from sort of all the perspectives on the panel here yeah so i think the the, the center fails if it's if it's the place of managing the status quo right the center's got to be the place where it's you, you're capable of driving change but in a way that brings people together and that's why the poll that Stefan's done is interesting because it shows you there is terrain upon which you could construct such a, a, a center ground coalition, but it's got to be making change. That's why, you know, if I was back in government today, you know, the debate I would be having on healthcare is not, which is the, the UK debate, right? The Tories say we're going to spend X billion more and Labour says, yeah, but we're going to spend two X billion more. No. How do you, what is the way that we are going to be able to reimagine our healthcare system today in order to provide much better and, and, and more um, sensitive service to people at a lower cost, actually, as a result of applying technology sensibly? How can we do that? You know, so these are the things. So I think it's both about making sure you're just not a manager of the status quo and making sure then that you're recognizing that there is a coalition that you can put together that can allow you to, you know, to, to make change that keeps people together rather than divided. You know, I often wondered, and people have asked me if I'm going to go into government anytime, and I always say no, and I'll tell you why, because coming out of the private sector, you always come up with the right solution to create value for the company and then figure out how to make the change happen. My observation with politics, just my observation, Tony, is that you start with what's gonna be good for my uh, section of the uh, uh, population, whether you're on the right or the left, and then come up with a solution that appeals to them as opposed to what's the right solution for the public as a whole. So when you have to start off with all of those constraints and limiting factors, you're never going to get to the right solution that's right for the public as a whole. And so people like me will never succeed in politics, which is a problem because you want younger versions of me to go into politics. That's the problem that. we have. Yeah. And the political system is full of people who are already polarized to start with. They spin everything to their sides as opposed to, hey, what do the citizens of our country want? This is just my naive observation. <laughs> well, no, I think it's, it's a very important observation. I mean, just one quick comment. When I was in government, and for example, we would have a discussion around the cabinet table on education. I always used to say, okay, first of all, let's think about this as parents. Okay. Then afterwards, let's think about the politics. But first of all, let's just think, what do we want for our kids? So I'm afraid you're right about a lot of politics, but it doesn't have to be like that. And it's not always like that. So I guess one of the, sort of the, the follow-ons to this, and Stefan, again, you might want to sort of take the, the sort of lead on this, is that social media and some of the parts of you know, technology and the information age has actually created more noise. And I guess how you sort of navigate the signal and the noise would be sort of an interesting question for politicians today. And, you know, to sort of build on Indra's point and sort of Tony's, like, you know, if you wanted to do a broad coalition, so sort of how do you sort of cut through that noise? It's, it's incredibly hard because um, the two types of media also mirror each other constantly. Uh, and therefore, um, the politicians find themselves really on the edge of that debate. What's um, been so striking about certainly the UK experience, um, watching what's happening um, with the pandemic, is um, how difficult it is uh, for anyone to speak and debate anything about the pandemic, because there's this added level now that deaths are going to be hung on you if you've uh, done something wrong, or and 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 it's you know you're having to make decisions, um, looking at one number and not worrying about all the other numbers. It becomes, I think, very very hard to act in that in that uh, in that environment, um, and there's no incentive for anyone to change this. Uh, it is, um, as Tony said, it is fundamental to the nature of, uh, of the media, uh, and I wouldn't blame them either for it. We have, we're, we're looking around for a, for a solution, um, but argument is what keeps us, uh, keeps us awake and excited and interesting, uh, interested. Uh, so I don't know how you overcome that. Great. Um, and so another sort of big theme of questions that are coming through from the audience is, uh, is around China. And actually, 
what would a strategic framework look like to deal with them today? And then um, perhaps you sort of want to lead on this, Indra, as sort of having reflected on this during the panel and sort of how you sort of bring together all the different sort of countries and sort of interests uh, and how you overcome some of those complexities within the debate today. Well, the person who is uniquely qualified to talk about the strategic framework is Tony Blair. So I really defer to the master here. So Tony, go ahead, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I mean, I, I set out what I call the three C's of the, the framework, which is confrontation, competition, cooperation. Um, I think the most important thing is you're much better able to deal with China from a Western perspective if the West itself is strong. And therefore, I, the point that I would make here is that I think the alliance between America, Europe, other nations, if you like, who are democratic nations, that is going to be important, not in confrontation with China as a matter of principle, but important because you need to be strong enough to engage China on, on equal terms where you need to, and also to influence the debate inside China. Because one of the things that I think Western politicians often misunderstand about China and its system is it's a lot more complicated and layered than it looks to the outside world. And there's a constant debate going on in China between basically reformers and nationalists. And again, there's maybe some middle ground between the two of those, but it's important for us to be coherent and clear in order also to influence that internal debate. And I just make one final point, which is I think this Cold War analogy is dangerous and wrong. I don't like it. I think it's a complete misunderstanding of what I think are fundamental differences between the old Soviet Union and China. And so I think my, my view of the strategic framework is that strategic to me means you understand China's power is here to stay. You understand that it can pose certain challenges and you have a realistic partnership of nations able to navigate that successfully. But our task is not to say to the Chinese, you shouldn't be a risen power. Because A, that's not going to work, and B, it's not right in principle. Completely agree with Tony. Brilliant. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left then. I think just the, the short, sharp one then, which is coming from any is COVID and the current pandemic a threat to globalization or a potential improvement to it? Uh, well, just very briefly, my view is it's, we would be so much better off if we cooperated globally on it from the very beginning. And I think the absence of global cooperation has probably put us two to three months behind where we otherwise could have been actually. I mean, you just take testing because both Indra and I have been uh, very interested in this question of how you, you develop rapid, easy tests because testing is going to be one major part of managing the pandemic, obviously it is, is one major part. Think how much better off you'd be if right at the very beginning, the countries had come together and incentivized the development of rapid, easy to use tests. We probably have got them several months before the time we have them. So yeah, no, I think, I think even though some people will be looking at aspects of this saying, we've got to repatriate certain supply chains and so on and so forth. I think most people in the world, I think the poll shows this, Stefan, most people in the world think, yes, of course, it means there should be greater global cooperation. It's a global pandemic. I think, Benedict, we had many, many fault lines running through our societies, many fault lines. And what this pandemic did was bring it all to the fore, whether it was inequality, whether it was climate change, the weakness of multilateral organizations, the lack of structure for pandemic management in many governments. It brought all of these issues to the fore. So we can either look at this pandemic as a wake up call, let's go back and relook at all of this and rebuild it. Or we can say this too will pass. Let's go back to the way we are, we've always been doing things. If we did that, then we've lost a great opportunity to create a better world. And I hope that's not where we end up. I hope we really go back and understand what didn't work and fix those things. Yeah, 
Fantastic, Stefan. I'll hand over to you. Um, thanks, everyone, for the questions, and Stefan can do the closing. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, an interesting place to finish. It's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you for Tony, to Tony and Indra for your insights today. Um, I was going to have think of making a summary of some of the points, but actually that would be a waste of time. You actually can replay this discussion in its entirety by going to the Tony Blair Institute website afterwards, uh, which has a nice simple URL institute.global. That's where you will find uh, the, uh, uh, the totality of this to replay in case you want to do that or share it with your friends. Uh, and uh, if you want the data from the um, YouGov Cambridge uh, uh, surveys, um, if you go to yougov.co.uk forward slash Cambridge, uh, you can see all of the data there. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to say thank you very much. Uh, to you all, thank you very much for our spectacularly interesting guests uh, and, uh, um, and uh, see you, I hope, next year with the part three of the survey. Bye-bye.